Ask, to Ask Dr. Renee. You guys know. Um, I am Ask Dr. Renee, and this is BlackDoctor.org. Thank you so much for joining me. This is, as I've told you, April has a whole lot of things going on, but today is really special because this is the first day of National Infertility Awareness Week. And so this week we are do I'm I'm gonna be on, you're gonna get sick of me every day this week, all the way up until Saturday, talking about fertility and all the different issues that can be involved with fertility. So I'm really excited. Tonight I'm calling it the REI's roundtable because we have hopefully three. One might be tied up, you know, this is a time sensitive business. So um, but we have amazing REIs that have loads of information and they look like us. So in case you're trying to get pregnant or you know somebody who's trying to conceive, um, please share the broadcast. Make sure you let us know where you're tuning in from and let them know that they need to watch this, okay? And if you have questions, make sure you put them in the chat. I will do my best to get them addressed, but obviously they can't do a consult right here on the, TV, on the camera, but we can hopefully get some questions answered so that you understand better what's going on. And um, so let's bring the ladies on. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hi. So today we are joined by Dr. Tiffany Jones, who is in Texas, correct? Yes, Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. And Dr. Erica Loudon, who is in lovely Chi-Town. Windy City. <laughs> yeah. So let's start off with... First of all, somebody said the other day they wanted to hear, how, they liked hearing how people became, as of last week, somebody said, how did you become a doctor? And so one of the, the doctor we had on, she explained. So how did you become a doctor? I mean, why did you become a doctor? But why did you become REI? So we'll start with you, Erica. Well, mine is, I'm really quirky. So my background, to try to make, not make it very long, is uh, I was a scientist first, so I went to, when I was in school, I did, like, you know, there were all these initiatives for minorities going into a research career, so I did one called Minority Initiatives for Access to Research Careers, and so I got into research as an undergrad, went to grad school, did a PhD, and I always kind of knew I wanted to do something in women's health, um, and I got tired of being bit by the mites, but I did find somebody, I found an REI who was at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Dr. Kelly Moley. And I was working with her on like poor pregnancy outcomes, looking at all sites in mice and like how they have these glucose transfers. I just really wanted to do OBGYN so I could be an REI. She was kind of my mentor and I wanted to be like her because I found it very fascinated, the science behind everything. Because similarly, at that time, there was this um, this um, doctor named John Tilly who said he found these oocyte stem cells. And I was like, God, if we can beat the clock, we found these stem cells and we can actually, you know, women who ovaries aren't responding, we can make these grow. Da, 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 da. So the science behind everything is what kind of propelled me into like, OK, I knew I went to med school knowing I was going to do OBGYN because I was going to be REI because I wanted to like not manipulate the system, but I wanted to help people kind of overcome those struggles because I didn't find it fair that women, we really do have a clock, whereas men, as long as they stay healthy, can have babies for the rest of their life. I'm like, why is that? Can we do something about this guy? Let's do this. <laughs> I love it. What about you, Tiffany? Yeah, so um, Erica and I are really paralleled um, in our journeys. So I also started off as like a, a scientist. I did a program called Bridges to Baccalaureate for minority students. And so one, I would say that you can see how important these programs are to introduce people into the sciences. I did not have anyone in my family in the sciences or in medicine, but from the age of five, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, just like my pediatrician, who is an African-American male. And I was like, I'm going to be a pediatrician. I'm going to be a pediatrician. So again, seeing people who look like you can really empower you, even if you don't have it in your general circle, can have you, you know, try to reach things that maybe otherwise you wouldn't think are attainable. So when I did that program, I actually did 10 years of research. I did infectious disease research on MRI. SA, um, and I thought maybe I'd do an MD PhD because I really, really love science. I love the petri dish. I love counting and and you know having a a theory and then seeing the outcome and analyzing things. I loved it. 
but I never wanted to not see patients. And I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. So when I went to medical school and we did our rotations, I went to Meharry Medical College. And when I did my pediatrics rotation, I was like, ew, these kids are always sick. I really, they don't talk. This is horrible. Who would do this? No offense to you pediatricians. Y'all some strong people. Yeah. And those people on base of, of nothing, okay? Because they can't tell you anything. And the parents and all that, I was like, I cannot. So, um, you know, when I did my OB rotation, even though I thought I would never want to do OB, I fell in love. I fell in love with, you know, seeing women from a very early age, like teenage throughout their life course to menopause and, you know, seeing people and fellowship with fellowshipping with people along their life journey. That would just it just spoke to me. And then going to residency at USC, I actually had access to be, um, you know, in REI rotations, which everyone does it, you know, and so I was with Dr. Richard Paulson, with Dr. Kristen Ben Dixon, who's now at Kind Body. And, you know, it just opened my eyes that, um, you know, not only could I do ob and be with these women, it's also a lot of science there. It's very new, very innovative. So, you know, you really can have the best of both worlds. You know, it's like an IVF cycle is like a mini, you know, research project with a specific subject, you know, getting all these analytics, finding the right protocol, and then seeing an outcome and seeing it through. And these women, you know, they are goal driven, they have, you know, sacrificed so much to get, you know, whatever they decided was what they wanted to attain in their life. And I just did not think again, like Dr. Loudon said, that it was fair, that we have to also then sacrifice being a parent because our biological clock has ticked on faster than we were able to, you know, get these goals. And so it is really just um, so fulfilling to be an REI, you know, and to work with women on so many levels and to help them achieve that one dream that maybe they need just a little more help doing. Okay. That both stories are amazing. Love it. Yeah, so, let me just feedback back on that too. Like she said how her example was her pediatrician. Mine seems very corny because I knew I like women's health. Just because yeah. of Bill Cosby, which is, he never I'm really No, you can't <laughs> say it, but let me tell you, it's a different world where I come it's from. It's a different world. Of it, of it. So that was like first time you saw a black, for me, a black doctor, because I didn't have a black pediatrician, a black doctor who was like taking care of women and was successful. And like, so that was, for me, it was kind of one of those other things that ignited my interest. Yeah. My and Dr. Wife. Valerie Montgomery Rice was um, at Meharry when I was there. So again, you know, like these people, they play a pivotal role in just nurturing us and, you know, seeing us to that next level. And without that, you know, you may not, you may not dream as big. So I'm really, really fortunate to have had that. Yeah, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice has been here on Black Doctor with us several times. Um, she's amazing. Yeah. But um, I was going to say my allergist, was a black woman. And <clears throat> after my mom fired the pediatrician <laughs> who was other, that's who was my pediatrician. So, cause I have severe asthma. So it was most important, obviously that I breathe. So, <laughs> so but um, so Dr. Loudon, can you please start us off and tell us what is the best time for somebody to come and see you guys? So the best time, so there's several. So if you're speaking purely for infertility, you have been, you're less than 35, you've been having unprotected intercourse for a year, it's time to see somebody, don't keep waiting. Also, uh, if you are over 35 and it's been six months of unprotected intercourse, it's time to see somebody. There are caveats in each one of those groups. Like if you already know that you have irregular cycles of PCOS or fibroids, some other gynecological issue, I always say then don't even wait those 12 months because I could be working you up during those 12 months, like making sure, oh, your fibroids, are they in the cavity? You know, why are your cycles there? Do you have PCOS and you're going to need some assistance? The reason why you haven't gotten pregnant in these nine months. We, we can do that workup while we wait those additional months. So there are some small caveats, but the true definition is based off for age and the time in which you've been trying to conceive. And then the last group is those who are not ready for children, but you have that desire and you know you're going to be delaying. So for all my you know professionals, whether you're in law school, you're in medical school, you're in business school, and you know that that's going to be delayed, you can freeze eggs. 
So that's another group of patients that or a population that you say, you know, see us sooner than later, because you surprise, surprise. This is something I always talk with my colleagues. We try so hard not to get pregnant in our 20s. We're on birth control. And then when we're ready to try, we stop the birth control. We find like we've been masking some symptoms and there's been a problem there. Then we're now we're kind of behind the bullet trying to chase that issue. So there's those are some of the times in which I say a patient should come sooner than later. Um, but there are some other caveats, of course, as well. Yeah. And, you know, I always say um, as an advocate for fertility and trying to get the word out, I've always said, unfortunately, in the black community, we are told, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant. But they never remember to remind you later, oh, by the way, you need to do that now. Well, your grandma might. <laughs> we going to have that baby, right? <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, and the other thing is, you know, I noticed from some friends that were not black, they said, oh, well, my grandmother, she gave me uh, egg freezing when I turned 30 mm -hmm. or when I turned 21. Mm -hmm. My grandmother didn't even mention that. My she mother didn't know. Didn't didn't know. Exactly. Right. And that's what I'm saying. That's why I want to change the conversation so that we start having that conversation with our godchildren, nieces, nephews, children, grandchildren, so that we can start doing that mm -hmm. for each other because they have all these plans for them. Yeah, right. no, I, I, really, I really think it should be start like health. I don't know what happens in high school anymore. You know, the sex education class, it needs it really wasn't good when I was in high school. And that's been some some decades now. Oh, but yeah. I think <laughs> they didn't, really didn't teach you about your menstrual cycle really well. I think education about like fertility needs to be better. And it can start in high school. You know, parents are afraid that we're teaching them how to have or promoting practical promiscuity, but we're not. It's just so you know your body when something's not right and then the steps to take. When do you see a provider about these things? And no, we're not saying to go and have a child at 21 because people are delaying that, but be prepared. So, you know, we know about egg freezing. We don't know about these things. That's why we don't get gifted that. So right. if you don't know, how can you do better? Right. And I would say not only um, is it that we don't know, sometimes I think in our culture, and I like to speak to people in this manner because, you know, everyone has a culture but sometimes i feel like people don't understand that black people have a culture too like you know if we have a culture and in our culture some of these things you know whether it be religious or you know that's not what god would want for us that's not you know like you also have to speak to that because even if you know you know like sometimes you get this negative pushback you know i think you know donor eggs or that's something that's really stigmatized where in some of the other cultures i don't people, you know, get eggs from their sister and, you know, it just may not be the same for us. It may not, you know, it's, yeah, we don't know about it, but then it's also like, you know, we don't trust medicine as much. You know, there's some other barriers that we have to work through, not just talking about it, but really just breaking it down and becoming more accepting of it and knowing that sometimes people do need these type of things. Right. Yeah. And that, that's, that's why it has to be a normalized conversation so that you're not, you know, you can talk about it amongst your friends and they're not going to say anything about, you know, bad to you or anything or your family, mm -hmm. just like mental health. Let's not, you know, let's no, just, not stigmatize not, it. Let's stigmatize. Also, don't sit there and keep asking people when they're having children because that's not the right thing to do either. Yeah, true. But if someone opens up to you that they're having trouble, don't make them feel like something's wrong with them. Help, encourage them to go figure out what is going on so that they can, because there are things that we can be do, we can do, right? Right. So, we have uh, a question. Like everything or uh, prevent, uh, prevention is better, like than trying mm -hmm. to treat it later. So it's kind of that. Um, AAP, interestingly, I was reading today and they said it was 49% of um, Black, Indigenous people have stiff, feel like stigma, the reason why they don't discuss it. And mm -hmm. part of it is because there's lack of cultural competencies that are in our clinics or in our society overall. Because, uh, and I've, this story has been like, we know everybody knows somebody in our family who had a child like at 45 or 47, mm -hmm. maybe 50. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, oh, I'll be all right. It's just going to take some more time. Well, instead of getting it worked up or, oh, it's something wrong with me. It's, this is not a disease. I did something wrong because I had I had a termination of a pregnancy mm -hmm. and a punishment. Like these, these kind of things that don't make sense, but we accept it and we're not hearing it differently. But how do we address that? It's kind of why we're here today to kind of yeah. break those stigmas slowly and educate our community. So we have a good question. This is from my mentee. Um, if you have PCOS symptoms, does that automatically mean you should get checked out or that you will have difficulty getting pregnant? 
Tiffany, why don't you take this? Yeah, yeah. so um, if you have symptoms of PCOS, I think you should get it checked out. I think you should get an assessment. Um, typical symptoms of PCOS may be a regular period. So like Dr. Loudon said, you know, if your cycles are regular, and Dr. Duke, if she was here, she would say, your period is the fifth vital sign. I like that. Uh, I'm not stealing them. Give her credit. That's her saying. And it is true, right? So when you have anything that is... Um, not in the normal, getting it checked out to make sure everything is okay is fine. Some people might have um, what we call hirsutism or abnormal hair growth, um, uh, dark hairs like on the, on the upper lip, on the chin, on the chest, um, uh, you know, uh, on the uh, around the, um, uh, the belly button. Um, some people can have maybe even baldness because it's really your androgen levels may be elevated and that can lead to other types of system uh, symptoms. Acne um, can be one. So I think, you know, getting an evaluation is definitely something that can be done. But no, not all people with PCOS have infertility. And so that's something, you know, that people should know. But PCOS patients do have an increased risk of having infertility. So knowing you have that diagnosis and if you have irregular cycles, then you might want to get when you're ready to get pregnant, to get a fertility evaluation sooner rather than later. And, and Dr. Loudon, could you tell us exactly what PCOS is? I forgot to say that up front. Uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, Dr. T Dr. Jones explained it very well, but I also want to kind of quote, broke some of people, Regina Townsend and Broken Brown Neck. PCOS, the reason why it also needs to be evaluated because it's more than about infertility. Mm -hmm. It affects other metabolic symptoms in your body. And those are things that your primary care doctor needs to be aware of if you get diagnosed. So, for example, you can have high cholesterol. You can be insulin resistant. Um, it also can cause you to be increased risk for uterine cancers because mm -hmm. if that lining is not shedding regularly, you can get uh, something called endometrial hyperplasia where the lining is just thickening. So those things need to be followed up. And so it's more than about just infertility. Um, when you have a diagnosis of PCOS. So that's another reason to just make sure if you're having symptoms, get it evaluated. Thank you so much. That, um, th I, hopefully that answered the question. I think that that was very thorough. Um, I wanted to talk about what are some of the maybe common, and I'm sure we're all different though, common reasons why black women have fertility problems. <laughs> Jones, a loud, it doesn't matter, somebody. So I'll start. Um, uh, I think that just like most women who um, present with infertility, you may have waited a little longer. I do notice that most of my African-American patients or, or African patients, they are likely to, more likely to be over 35. Um, and so that in and of itself, we have to understand that at the age of 35, not that all is lost. OK, I do tell people that it's not that you're going to have infertility, but infertility rates increase. And our fertility, our fertility does start to increase, uh, decrease. And we should all know that we are all going towards menopause, towards a time where we cannot have children anymore, where we don't ovulate anymore. I think for Black women in particular, I don't think anyone could guess any of our ages, right? Because <laughs> Black don't crack. At least it don't crack like that, you know? And so I look in the mirror and can't nobody tell me I ain't 23. Try it. Yes. <laughs> okay. But these eggs are not 23 anymore. Right. And so it's kind of hard sometimes, you know, like we're living our lives, we're feeling good, we're doing the best. And then we're not really understanding that our biological clock is going at a rate, even if our wrinkles aren't there. You know, it's just we don't look like we're going to menopause. No one would say Janet Jackson couldn't have a baby, but I know that it's very difficult to have a baby at 50. You know, and most patients would not even get the chance to have a baby of their own at 50. Um, fibroids would be another thing that um, black women are much more at risk of having. And when we talk about, oh, at the age of 35, 12 months, you know, I think, you know, it's something to say that we're not really considered in a way, you know, like when you put in everyone statistically, if black women have a hot 80 percent of us will have a fibroid yet how many of my patients have ever had an ultrasound but when i do their first ever ultrasound they got this big old fibroid right in their uterus that is absolutely causing hot heavy bleeding absolutely a reason why an embryo would not ever implant or fallopian tube could be blocked or whatever and it's like 
you told this woman to wait 12 months and you know mm -hmm. what is her risk factors you know i'll let dr loudon talk about some other things but those are some of the ones that i would say age um you know letting ourselves you know get to an age when a lot of us are really highly educated so we're, we're on that career path and then it just gets away from us. And then fibroids is another is another big one. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with all that. Plus, um, and I always tell my patients, age is the single most prognostic factor because you can be PCOS and have a lot of eggs, but half those eggs aren't good if you wait till the wrong time in life to use them. Um, but outside of like you know, delaying care, the aging is also kind of, it's inappropriate care. I hate to throw my system under the bus, but I have, I, it breaks my heart every time I see a PCOS girl, for example, and I don't want to keep blaring PCOS, but come in and nobody's ever evaluated her. They just tell all oh, you have irregular peers and throw birth controls, never did a scan, never did any workup. And guess what? She's not PCOS. She's premature ovarian insufficiency, mm -hmm. which is a woman who's less than 40, who is going into her early menopause. And she's not having peers because she's in menopause. Mm -hmm. And that is a travesty that happens to a lot of people of minority origin. They don't get the workup that they need. They just get slapped medication and sent away and nothing ever. No ultrasound, like Dr. Jones just said, no ultrasound, no labs, just giving a, a bandage on it. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Or even like, you know, endometriosis, because we talked about fire rates, PCL. Endometriosis, like, is not a true um, incidence or prevalence that's listed for minorities. That's because a study at University of Michigan showed that when they did surveys, a lot of women who were minorities who came in complained about pain was thought that they were drug seeking and they just got sent away. Nothing was ever done. Come to find out they have endometriosis. They're not there just crying. But, you know, we're told that we are the stigma for black women is we're very stoic. We're strong. We are built that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's in our DNA. But when they come and they are complaining, it's usually for a reason. And we are complaining because we do carry a lot before we go to Because we don't want to be there in the first place, okay? Don't. We don't even want to go to the doctor. So if I come here, I don't even want to be here, but I'm here because I need to. So it's like, really, you got to, like, it's, it's got to a point where it's like fever pitch. And that's just, it's just very different, but we're dismissed. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. dismissed. So that's, that's what I mean. We're getting dismissed. When we finally, we delay care. When we finally come, we're dismissed. For the stigmatized stigmas of society that's been placed on black people as a whole. That is one of the problems. And so once again, now you're, you're breaking the trust system. I came and you wouldn't help me. So now no, I'm not coming back. And when they finally do show up and need help, well, we're kind of once again, we're in that point where now you're diminished ovarian reserve. Now there's something else that we have to treat in order to get you to where we want to so your goals of having a family in this instance. But there's so many different other examples there. Yeah. Um, access to care, you know, um, fertility clinics are concentrated in some of these areas where maybe they're not accessible. Like if you look at, you know, like LA, for instance, there are probably 30, 40 <laughs> clinics in LA, but they, where we live, right? Right. And, you know, and so also when you go, you know, if you don't know anything, right, if you're not watching talks like this or talking amongst your friends or know anyone who's done it, you go to your OB, right? So they're the first person. But if your OB doesn't maybe think that this is something that you could afford, you may not even ever be referred. You know, you might never get that, you know, subspect because people will look at you and they will prejudge and say what, you know, what you can do. Like, I'm not going to send her to the expensive REI because she can't even, you know, and then also insurance coverage, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, are we for access to care or are we not, you know, like, and so if people don't have insurance coverage for it, then it's a lot of money out of pocket, you know? So we, you know, there's a lot of barriers. It's not just for people who look like us. It's for, it can go through people who don't look like us. And these are things that we have to address, but sometimes they really do disproportionately affect people who look like us. Definitely. I have a friend, I always tell the story. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately she, she had insurance, but she was in a state that wasn't mandated. So insurance was useless and we'll explain that later, but she went to the REI and he said, this is what you need, which I'm not quite sure I agreed with what he said, but he said, this is what you need. And he looked at her and was like, but can you afford this? Let he said it to her face. <laughs> and she was like, and she, mind you, she's single. She mm -hmm. sat there and goes, my husband will pay for this. 
She was like, he going to say something stupid. I'm going to say I'm something gonna say, stupid. Listen, I got something for you. Right. right. But, um, and then I have another friend, my friend, Christia Donaldson, that created Thank God It's Natural Hair Products. Mm. She wrote in her book, she went to something uh, the Junior League had about fertility. And she went to her doctor and said, hey, I think I need to freeze my eggs. She was 34. And her doctor's like, you're healthy. You're fine. You don't need to freeze your eggs. Well, Christia, if anyone knows my Christia, may she rest in peace. Smart girl. She's an attorney and she's a smart girl. She said, no, I need to freeze my eggs. She froze her eggs. She was diagnosed with breast cancer the next year. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. she did die of breast cancer last year. But um, she talked about that in her book. Yeah. And she went to the OB and the OB was like, you don't need to worry about this. Yeah. Right. And like, I would say, you know, some of it, it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to like rag on anybody. You right. Know, I'm we, not have, we have governing bodies. So when I talk about the ultrasound and stuff, it's not really because, you know, OBs don't want to do this. It's how we were trained. I was trained in the same system. What do you do when someone has irregular bleeding? The first thing we did was put them on birth control pills. That's what we, we do the pregnancy test. Number one, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, pregnancy test and then a birth control pill. And so it's just like it's not in our it's not in our algorithm. It's not how we look at things. And you you know like even though you know we know statistics, it's like okay, well let's just see if the birth control pills help. And it might. It actually might help. And there's a place for that. But if you put somebody on birth control pills, like Dr. Loudon has already said, and you never diagnose the under problem now her fibroid that was two centimeters and some mucosal at age 30 and some mucosal means it's inside the womb where the baby would implant now she's ready to have a baby at 35 and that thing is eight centimeters right and she didn't have bleeding problems anymore but now she's facing a major surgery when I, no, I, if I didn't want to go to the doctor I dang sure didn't want to have no major surgery you know right. so it's just like we're we have to kind of change, you know, as the field gets younger, as the field gets more female, as, as the field gets more diverse, we have to throw out some of these old tropes. We have to say, you have an ultrasound machine in your office. You have a sonographer in your office, you know, like, isn't it worth it just to make sure when you know there's this higher statistic for this type of person like you know like is you know like you're not saving anyone money up front because down the road it's going to cause a lot more problems and a lot more distrust because when i tell this patient who's been seeing her ob right. for 20 years that she has 20 fibroids and been on birth control pills for this whole time who she mad at you know, and it's not that the OB really did anything wrong. That's how we were taught. But I think it's time for a change. And that change comes to like we're educating our colleagues, but patients education because the difference between that I see between my patients who look like me and others, my they we don't come and say, ah, oh, you know, I read this and what is this? I'm having this bleeding. I was told that it could be a polyp or fibroid. I want to test for that. I, my other patients, the majority. They will come and they've been reading it or they talk to a friend and they're requesting the test. So mm -hmm. that comes for us advocating for ourselves as you learn, of course, because you yeah. can't do anything if you don't know it. But it also with our colleagues, too, is also the system as you're meaning, like we say, why don't you just do an ultrasound? Well, the system, I have clients who are generalists still practicing where they get 15 minute slots to see a patient. Yes. They don't have time to do all those other extra steps. And that's a problem in the system because maybe some patients you got to build them, like put them in as a 30 minute cycle. You know, the history they're coming for abnormal urine bleeding is more complicated than I just need to like do a follow up and talk to you and send you out the door. So our system overall needs a hauling. Like you have to give appropriate time. Of course, we can't spend an hour with the patient, mm -hmm. but if I need to do ultrasound then I need to make sure that patient has a more, a bigger time slide. Not that I'm just trying to see 20 patients in my work day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say like for the, um, you know, being an advocate for yourself, I'm all for that. But I love the movie Color Purple. <laughs> and I say that all my life I had to fight. <laughs> and sometimes you get tired. And I feel yeah, like I it's really hard to always put the onus on me. Mm -hmm. you, if you're the patient that, yes, you should come in, you should read, you should do this. But I went to medical school. I'm the doctor. And if why I got to come in here and fight with you for the stuff I should be getting, you know? Exactly. And so, yes, we have to do that now. But I'm going to tell you, as a black woman myself, I'm tired. You know, just right. do me right. You know? You want that. And when you find it, you stay. 
that's the problem. We're not getting at every yeah. every clinic or every physician. So what do you do? You can't, you can't, it's preventative. Yeah. You have to fight for, for your level. We need, we need change. We have to be advocates, but I'm not gonna put it all on us. Okay, no, it's never enough. all on you. We got enough. <laughs> Um, so I had mentioned mandated states. So there's 19 states in the country that mm -hmm. it is they have to have fertility covered in some way on insurance and different states are different coverages. But I will say the state of Illinois does us very well. <laughs> we do. Yes. Thank God for the statement. But there are some loopholes and that's where you have to look, because if you're the loophole, because the companies that you can be have a job here in Illinois, but if their headquarters is not in Illinois, they don't have to offer you coverage, which is a travesty. But that is the loophole there. So I have patients who do work here and don't have coverage. And then I have people who work for the military, TRICARE. They're in the state of Illinois, don't have coverage. Yeah. Guess what? I have I have people patients who are working at Starbucks because Starbucks and I'm not I'm not endorsing anybody but Starbucks T-Mobile they give their employees coverage and they don't have to and it doesn't matter that you're in a state mandated mm -hmm. um, place location you can be right. anywhere yeah, in a Starbucks I think Amazon does too mm -hmm. um, yeah. So my patients are taking part-time jobs because they thought their mm -hmm. job was going to cover their fertility card package and it doesn't. And so I have a patient who went and worked for 30, 90 days, got her 90 days, and she's going to stay at Starbucks, but she's getting her coverage and she's going to do her IVF because this is what she has to do because this is something that she realizes is, is necessary and she doesn't have time to keep waiting to hope that the rules change for her. Right. And the other thing is, in the same sense, if you work in a state that's not mandated, but your company is headquartered in a mandated state, then you get to have the benefit of that coverage um, being mandated. So um, just please talk to your HR departments. That's something else that a lot of us don't know. You can talk to HR and say, look, this is what I'm trying to do. I need to make sure that I have coverage for this. Right. Yeah. Also they, say should, they should work with you because I live because I work for myself. I went through the book and was like, OK, so this is what I'm trying to do. So I need to make sure it's covered. I went from a $3,000 deductible to $750. You know, I can get rid of $750 in two seconds. There was my cycle. Mm -hmm. It was covered 80% because I got rid of that deductible. As soon as I paid off the $750, I, my, my cycle was covered 80% and I only had to pay 20%. Right. So the awesome. other thing I would add to that is, um, you know, not everybody needs IVF, right? And right. so I think that's the that's also the thing that we really have to come across. Sometimes you need just the workup, and most insurances will cover the workup. Okay, and then I will try to hook and crook what we can for this. You know, you know, if you PCOS and you just need some letrozole, we'll do a cycle, and then you know, you don't need me to do no letrozole. You know, like we can. We can let you ovulate on your own because everybody doesn't need the most expensive thing, but right. but know that at least the workup. So then you get your foot in the door and you at least get an assessment and know what you need or, or, or understand what's wrong. And then we can figure out the like how to pay for the treatment. But your diagnostics are usually covered. So that right. means if you need to check to see if your tubes are open, you get that first ultrasound, you um, get the semen analysis or, you know, whatever you need under the diagnostic, um, that you can go and you can see a fertility specialist for that and then decide what is the best course of treatment. So before Absolutely. I go to this fertility specialist, what are the tests? And I know, but I want you guys to tell them what tests would you have anyone that is having periods every month, but I have told all my, my little sisters, as I call them, I've said, I don't care if you bleed every month, you could still have something wrong. Please go find out your numbers because then you know something. Right. What test would you have the OB add to their, um, you know, the blood work that they were gonna do anyway? What test would you have them add or make sure that they did and make sure they know the numbers? And then if they needed to go to REI, go from there. So I think um, the anti-mullerian hormone is a very, very good test. It's not cycle dependent, which um, is the reason I don't like getting FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone that comes from our brain um, and estrogen at the early part of our cycle, because you can only get it like 
you know, a couple days in the beginning of the month, whereas AMH, we can get it at any time. A lot of the OBs that I know don't really like to get it because when you get something, then you got to explain it. And again, when it comes to training, you know, depending on when you graduated or how much um, fertility exposure you got, you might not really understand what it means. And so um, it's hard to order things that you can't fully explain. But if patients got that, I think it would give them a really good eye-opening um, example of what their ovarian reserve or, or how many eggs they have at a given point in their life. Um, and if it's in the normal range, that's great. If it's in the lower range, especially when you're young, that's something that really can, you know, push you to go see someone sooner. Um, the problem with AMH is that it's really not a good marker if someone's not getting, trying to get pregnant, of if they can get pregnant. I've had people who have very low AMHs who get pregnant naturally. So it's again, it's it's a great test to give you an overview, but I don't want it to be a fear mongering test to say, oh, you are going to need this. You know, it's like we can't use it for fear, but it's just really for information and then what we do with that information. Yeah, I, I agree. And so um, definitely, you know, you can ask your OB to check that yes. for you. You just you're going to have blood work anyway, ask them to add that on. Um, and that'll be at least something. But I've really been advising people to just just go just and ask for a fertility workup. And Try I think an REI and ask for a fertility workup. I think there are um, companies now and I think Kind Body might be one. Modern Fertility is another um, where you don't actually have to even have a fertility or a physician order it. These are tests that you can order for yourself. And again, they will give you um, they will give you an analysis of that and it's some good information. And so I do like patients to know that they can take it into their own hands. Um, but, you know, when you do when you do that, you still might need to see somebody in person when you get a number that may be shocking to you. Um, and it's not the whole picture, but it is a good starting place. But if you want to do it just on your own, Modern Fertility is a company that um, you just poke your finger, mail it back, you know, and, and they'll give you a good assessment um, in the mail. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I agree. <laughs> there's tons of acronyms in this world. Can you explain, first of all, you've already said IVF, so just explain what IVF is. Uh, IVF is in vitro fertilization. So it's a process in which we take a woman through a stimulation cycle with injectable uh, FSH and LH hormones. And our goal is to get more than one follicle on like a normal menstrual cycle or intrauterine insemination cycle. Because the goal of IVF or in vitro fertilization is we hope that we can create all your potential family in one cycle. Sometimes it may take more. But essentially, after you've taken those FSH and LH medications to get your eggs to grow for the month that you've recruited, we have a small procedure where we aspirate right those eggs out and then we feed the fertilize them if you're creating your embryos and we can transfer or store them for a future. Or if you're freezing eggs, it kind of stops there. We get those eggs out and those that are mature, meaning they're able to receive sperm in the future to create an embryo, those are frozen for your future use. So IVF is usually can take anywhere from 12 to 14 days, kind of depends on the woman, how she's responding to the medications. Um, but yes, it's very doable. A lot of patients do it. Uh, however, as Dr. Jones said, IVF and vitro fertilization is not the only method. There's intrauterine insemination, which is one baby at a time is our goal with that one, not creating your whole family at one time. And so if you're somebody who just wants one child and you're not interested in creating a basketball team, no. <laughs> but you can definitely do IUI. If, all, if the tube's open, we have good sperm and we have a healthy egg count. And so with IUI, they still have to take some medications, correct? Correct, but it's oral medicine. Uh, sometimes we do injectables. If there is not a response to the oral induction medicines, then you might get injectable FSH medicines. Um, and then the other, only other time you get an injection with IUI is uh, to trigger, meaning we want those eggs to ovulate. We're timing the release of the eggs so we know when to do the insemination. Gotcha, gotcha. And so when are some times that somebody might have to use a donor egg? Yeah, so um, donor eggs typically are when a woman's ovarian reserve is um, so low that doing those medications, those injectable hormones, and um, those hormones that we're giving are the same that your body usually produces, but they're in much higher concentrations so that we can 
have multiple eggs to grow instead of what the body naturally wants to do is one egg. So even if a woman is um, having regular periods and ovulating, if she only has a small, small number, we may not be able to grow more than one egg. And, and if the patient is older, usually most clinics use 45 as a cutoff. Um, if someone um, can go through IVF, some people have no age cutoffs. We don't have an age cutoff, but we do look at people in their thorough assessment. And the older someone is, the less likely that the eggs that they have are viable. And so even if I have a 50 year old patient with an AMH of two, which is likely unheard of, even if I were to get 20 eggs from someone who's 50, most of those eggs, or I would say all of those eggs would be non-viable. So there is an age um, that um, really we can't kind of overcome what nature has done. And those women would need donor eggs. Even if you are young, if your ovarian reserve is, um, or your hormone levels are that of a patient or of a person who's in menopause, then again, there's nothing, your body's already making a very high amount of those hormones. So me giving you more is not going to stimulate you anymore. It's going to cost a lot of money and generate, you know, no success. So those patients typically, or, or if you've had, you know, both of your ovaries removed, and so then there's no way um, to get eggs, those patients would need um, donor eggs. Some people who have a specific genetic disorder, they may want to do donor eggs. Um, most of the time we can screen embryos, but um, sometimes people may want to use it for that reason. Definitely. Um, did you have anything to add, Dr. Lauda? No, she covered it. <laughs> and then also males. I don't want to leave out our males. So oh, yeah. have, um, um, like a, 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 a sex male couple, you know, there's no ovaries there. There's no um, there's no eggs. So then those people would have to use um, donor eggs and then a gestational carrier. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, what other information do you think that people don't have a clue and they need some they need to know this information? Uh, I think I would just add to kind of the accessibility is don't be afraid if you think that you're not in a mandated state, because even with that, uh, clinics have resources for you. There's grants out there. Um, we all, Sometimes they even offer their own financing packages. Like for me, full disclosure, when I was in fellowship, I was in a non-state, <laughs> there was not mandated state. And I took out a loan because I knew I wasn't married. I'm about to have a baby because I'm still like in my early career. So I took it. It's kind of it sounds very probably non exciting, but it's financing your future fertility. And sometimes if the value, if you place in so much value on it, there's ways to make this work for you. And so don't be afraid to have that discussion with your doctor because um, we direct you to our clinical financing people. We will try to figure out something that will work for you. We'll give you different options and we and you pick what will work for you that you feel comfortable with. Definitely. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when 20 years ago, how many years is, has, um, what was the first IVF? It's been over 40 years. 40 years. So it was a long time ago and that it was very expensive when it was very experimental. It's not that way now. So it is actually you know, people are shocked. They're like, oh, that's it. Exactly. It's not, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars unless you do multiple, you know, cycles, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it can be, you know, something that is cheaper than a car. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, yes. definitely cheaper than a house. So, you know, so people, you know, just need to understand that, you know, I know the figure I was given um, when I went to the event the first time was, I think, $17,000 if I had no insurance. And that was just a free egg freezing cycle. Oh, we we got that beat. Okay, <laughs> I'm like seventeen thousand. Yeah, that's not that's, a lot. Lot. <laughs> that's, not, that's not. including me as Dr. Renee. Huh? That's, that's a lot of me. medications because that's a lot. For... I think it did include medication. That's a lot included medications. I would say most people would get under ten thousand dollars for an egg freezing cycle, including meds at this point. Um, you know, but I think, you know, you do have to do your due diligence, you know, just like you try to find the best price of something, you get a, you know, get a workup, you see what it is, and then you get a price. And if you don't like it, 
try to do your research and see what's out there. Um, I don't think there's a lot of resources, you know, as far as grants for egg freezing, and I hope that changes. But for IVF, uh, you know, resolve.org, um, they're a great resource with linking people to, um, you know, different grants um, through uh, fertility um, organizations. People who have cancer um, get discounted cycles and um, free medications from most companies. And so, you know, we know where there's a will, there's a way. So you just have to kind of do your due diligence, but don't ever let fear lead you at all. No, definitely do the right. research because that there, I think it's a resolve site too, that you can get discounts for your medication even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, yeah, the insurance might cover the doctor and the um, procedures, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the medication, they usually want you to pay that part out of yeah. pocket. And Farin, Farin does discounts for egg freezing medications, like so for Menopure, which is a medication that most of us use in our um, cycles for stimulation. Um, they discount that like almost like 40% for people who are undergoing egg freezing because, you know, they know that you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit pricey. So there's, there's ways of doing it. It's not free, not at all, but it's um, definitely more attainable than it was 40 years ago. Exactly. And on that, like most of your clinics, you have like, you know, where the pharmacies that are local, at least for us in Illinois, mm -hmm. where right. they have discounted rates for our self-pay patients. And we have coupon code. So we work to get our patients, like most clinics would work very hard to get you the best price if you are self-pay so that you're not kind of, having to face a huge debt at the end of um, the whole treatment cycle. And on that note, I will plug, Kind Body has a grant right now, um, $50,000 that they're giving away. You can apply at Kind Body site. They're doing three grants in conjunction with Fertility for Colored Girls, which is one of the, it's a national advocacy group that's headquartered here in Chicago. So I encourage women to apply. I don't know if it's covered egg freezing, but check mm -hmm. it out and see. Kindbody.org? Yes. Or dot com. Okay. Dot com. Okay. Yes. Got it. Um, also, like uh, as far as that fertility assessment, most clinics will like there's the um, post. So we have one with kind by this a home kit. But if you are close to one of the clinics, you can come out and do this like, like a ninety nine dollar assessment where you get your labs or you get an ultrasound. If you have a partner semen analysis, all that for ninety nine dollars. And then you get a 10 minute consult with a physician just to tell you, like, what do these numbers mean? So that you're not at home reading a paper trying to figure out mm -hmm. if you should be scared or not. Yeah. And also, I um, I have a Facebook group. These two ladies are so kind enough to join my group. And my Facebook group is Black Women Fertility. It is a closed group. So if you send me a message, I might let you in. Um, but uh, Braun Pharmaceuticals in Chicago is giving a discount to the members of the group. Um, so um, like I said, you can also um, send me a message if you'd like to join the group. And um, we can let you in, but kindbody.com that, ex, um, that is, is over April 30th. So you guys don't have a whole lot of time. It's the 25 days. Saturday. Yes. So <laughs> that's why I wanted to make sure you guys know Saturday is the last day to turn in your application for that. So please make certain that you do pay attention to that. We had, um, eggs over easy and had a bunch of the ladies from that film on here. Um, when the film was, uh, premiering on own mm -hmm. and Dr. Um, Camille Hammond was on and she has the Cade Foundation mm -hmm. and the Cade Foundation also does grants. I think it's twice a year. Yes. Does that sound right? Yes, um, twice a year. And I'm hoping I have this, email, this uh, website right, but it's Cade Foundation if I don't have it right and you guys can go look it up, but um, I'm going to post it on the, on the screen in a second, but um, that's another place that you can look for, um, for grants as well. But if you just Google, I'm telling you, you will be amazed how much you will find. Um, there is all sorts of money out there. If you're a same sex couple, if you're- um, yes. Can yes. I plug one to men yes. having yes. babies? Men, they're having a conference coming up very quickly and they give, like they cover like costs for same sex meals that go through treatments with donor eggs. So that's another good resource to definitely look because they sponsor you. Yeah, so definitely. So my thing is, I will be honest with you, when I went to the REI that was not, did not look like me, she did not give me any kind of nothing. Mm -hmm. There was no, and when I spoke to the, um, what is, what is the financial person, she literally was like, okay, this, 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 how much encircled the amount she didn't offer. And she saw the shock in my face. I know she did. She didn't offer anything. So you guys, 
it pays to go to somebody who looks like us because that's the first time that I ever heard of any of these different grants and discount programs. No one ever mentioned. And I went, I was in the office more than once. No one ever said, oh, by the way, there was no brochures in the lobby, nothing. So you guys, it really does pay to go to somebody who does look like us because they are looking out for us. Um, can immature eggs that are harvested after sun cycle be used for future IVF? So um, some clinics do in vitro maturation. Um, I think that um, it, it's tough. Uh, the success rates are really not that great. It's about 1% uh, live birth rate for um, per egg, which is pretty low. Um, but some clinics do offer it. I think, um, Erica, CCRM might be one of the clinics who are kind of pioneering that, at least in my local area. They're the ones who I would send someone who... Um, needed that. There are reasons why people try to cultivate and culture immature eggs, but mm -hmm. most IVF cycles, I would say 99% of clinics are really trying to get you to maturity um, through that through that stimulation. That's why it lasts for, like Dr. Loudon said, 12 to 14 days, because we're trying to get the follicles, which are the nest of cells that um, kind of surround and, and nurture your eggs. And there's one egg in every follicle. When it gets to a certain size, an egg should be able to mature um, the type of trigger shot or the final um, medication you take should push the egg to become mature. I've had patients who, despite everything, don't produce mature eggs and there can be other issues in that and where they need in vitro maturation, but you would have to get to a clinic that really has um, a great protocol for that and not every clinic does. Right. And I'll say on that, we do it here at like Vials uh, slash Kind mm -hmm. Body to Remix, um, mm -hmm. but it's usually it's not the first go-to, it's mm -hmm. after you've done cycles and the follicles were big and pretty and we went in, you had a 10K trigger shot and getting eggs. Do it again, did a higher trigger, no mature eggs. Mm -hmm. When we see there's a problem with maturity, then that is the step with which then we talk about doing in vitro maturation. And there's several protocols. Some people for a, a true in vitro maturation protocol, they don't stim you at all. It's your antral follicles that are collected and then cultured to maturity. And I have seen them, the eggs will get mature. Some of them, will, not all of them are going to fertilize. But the problem is, once and again, is the percentage that makes it to a blast, a usable blastocyst is kind of where the challenge is. So you kind of do your homework with like where you go and if it's a possibility. It shouldn't be your first step that when you're trying to do IVF that you're going to do IBM. It's kind of like after we see there's something wrong with follicular maturation that we're not getting a mature egg that you go to that route. Oh, good to know. And Vios, you guys, is in more than one state. What states are Vios in? So we're in Illinois, um, Missouri, Milwaukee, Michigan, um, Portland, Oregon, or actually it's in, it was, it's in Washington uh, on the border. Um, those are where the original Vios clinics are, but now we have, we're merged with Kind Body. So Kind Body, we have 24 clinics now with them. Nice. So I wanted to say also, you guys, please make certain that when you are looking at a, a fertility clinic, you ask them what is their rate of success as in actual baby births because um, that information should be oh it should be public and if it's not you probably should find someplace else to go but um that was something i learned when i was looking was that you need to make sure you understand that information because what you do not want to do is take all your hard-earned money and spend mm -hmm. it someplace that can get you eggs and get them frozen but cannot thaw them and create babies so please make certain you do that research. And I'm going to uh, make sure these ladies let you know their information, because what I will tell you is that for myself, my REI is not in the same state as me. So you don't actually have to live in the same state. You could go to your REI virtually. They can set up so you do all your testing, blood work and everything somewhere close to your home. And you just show up to their door when it's time to trigger and um, for them to actually collect. You'll trigger at home and then they they are ready to do your um, your egg freezing and your, uh, your if it's IVF or whatever. So please, please, please make sure you call and figure out exactly what is their success rate and make certain that they are giving you the truth. And you should be able to find that online. But if you don't see that information online, ask and, see, and make sure you listen to them when they answer to make certain that they are telling you the truth and are not lying to you. But um, Dr. Loudon does 
fabulous IGs very regularly talking about this stuff. So one, I want you to make sure you tell your um, Instagram handle. And then two, I want you to please let us know how can we, you know, if, if we want to get with Vios or kind of, how do we find you guys? So I'm on Instagram as elown.fertility.doc. Um, and you can find me on there or you can also reach out to me on vialsfertility.com site, which is, and on the third site is kindbody.com. I'm all over the place, right? <laughs> so you can find me in multiple ways. Um, I'm really accessible. As Dr. Renee said, we see patients all over. So it's not a limitation based off of your location. And I hope to be able to answer any questions for you in the future. And thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening. Dr. Jones, you do the same, please. Yeah, so I am uh, T. Jones, IVFMD on Instagram. Um, not as active anymore on Instagram because my patient load is <laughs> very- you guys, she was blowing up Instagram. Her, her, <laughs> her little reels and stuff, her and her car partners, they- <laughs> Hilarious. So it's uh, T. Jones IVF MD. Got it. Uh, so got it. Fixing MD. it now. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, um, you know, like I love it when patients fly from other states. I do think sometimes it can be a little cumbersome. So I make sure I keep myself well connected with people who look like me and then people I trust that don't look like me because I don't think you necessarily have to go to a black physician, um, but you should, you know, go to somebody who you trust. Um, and so I'm happy, you know, if someone reaches out to me and I have a connection in a certain state or a certain city happy to um, help link you and I'm happy to see you. You know, we definitely try to make things the most convenient for our patients. Um, you can um, find me also at conceivefertilitycenter.com. Um, I have an office in Frisco, um, which if you're not in Dallas or Texas, you don't know what that means, but um, it's a little bit further from the airport. And I also have um, a office in Dallas. So, um, you know, just, and we see patients virtually as well. But um, Conceive Fertility? Conceivefertility.com. Got it. Yeah. And I have lovely partners too. So you don't have to see me. I would, I would trust them with my own eggs if I need to. <laughs> There we go. Okay, conceivefertility.com. Um, and of course, you can find her T. Jones IVF MD and Erica, no, E. Loudon. It's conceivefertilitycenter.com. See, I don't even know my own email address. I know I said it, I said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Escobar is like, girl. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You're going to have to start singing that song of uh, Tiana, Google Me Baby. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find me. You'll find her because Tiffany, T I F F A N N Y. Yes, two N's, two F's. Um, yeah. yeah, searchable. Yes. <laughs> but, um, ladies, thank you so much. I think that this was very helpful and a great start to a great week. Um, I'm really excited. Oh, and you know what? I wanted to mention this also. Stacey Edwards Dunn from Fertility for Color Girls has been watching, and she said that they provide grants and have a list of 50 grants under their resources. So look up fertility for colored girls and mm -hmm. check them out. And then, um, and I know she, I saw the website, she put it in the comments. So you guys, if you can see in the comments, you'll see the website, but just Google fertility for colored girls. And um, they have 50 grants under the resources. They've done some of the research for you. So yes. tomorrow we are talking about male factor. Um, so I'm really excited about that. We have a physician and we also have somebody, um, a lady who her and her husband experienced it. She's the author of the book, Semen Secrets, TJ Payton. So Dr. Danielle Lane will be with us tomorrow and I am so excited. I will see you guys again tomorrow. Same time, same place. Thank you guys. Thank you ladies very much.